Five Live Formula One. After torrential rain and mixed conditions, qualifying for the Dutch Grand Prix was dry and it was Lando Norris in the McLaren who took pole position. I think really raining on the parade of Max Verstappen and the Dutch fans who were hoping they would see Verstappen take pole for the fourth time here in Zandvoort, but it wasn't to be. Joining me, Rosanna Tennant, is our lead commentator, Harry Benjamin, and the BBC's F1 correspondent, Andrew Benson, to talk about what we saw this afternoon. Lando Norris on pole position, was that what you were expecting this afternoon, Harry? Um, you know what, I, I think it, we were expecting it in the end. Off, off of the limited data we had to go off from the, those uh, interrupted practice sessions, Norris and McLaren with that new upgrade uh, did look fastest and were quick out the bat throughout of qualifying, really. It was fine margins, though, till the final part in qualifying, where it was, what, over three and a half tenths of gap he pulled out, which round here uh, is, is pretty sensational. I must say, though, qualifying was all held in the dry. We've had to retreat to record this in, into the commentary box because it is absolutely... Uh, pouring down outside the F1 Academy races just had to be postponed and, and imagine if this had happened you know an hour or so ago I think we'd still be here for qualifying well we're going to record the pod and then we're going to stay here overnight because yep. if it continues like this quite frankly I'm not commuting back to the hotel Andrew I don't know about you but no well, I've just walked over from the press room and I've got wet trousers already, Rosanna. You're so, a martyr. <laughs> You're a martyr to the cause of the Checkered Flag podcast, and I respect you for it. Um, was it an exciting qualifying session? Did it kind of get you on the edge of your seat? I didn't. For me, it wasn't like nip and tuck. I don't know why. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah, definitely exciting. I mean, Lando Norris's lap was absolutely outstanding. Uh, he's just described it as his best lap uh, of his career in the in the press conference uh, after the TV interviews after qualifying, um, and it looked like it. You don't beat Max Verstappen by three and a half tenths around Zandvoort unless you've done a pretty special lap. And also, not, let's not forget Oscar Piastri, just behind Verstappen in the second McLaren, he's half a second slower than Norris. So that was some performance. Of course, the wind's been changing a lot. Maybe you get a bit lucky with your lap timing and all the rest of it. But even so, we shouldn't take anything away from Norris. But as Harry said, he has looked the form guy all weekend he wasn't quite quickest yesterday that was George Russell but he was absolutely blistering on the long runs which are normally the better indication of form on a Friday than the uh, the short qualifying uh, style runs so I did I also expected him to be on pole I didn't expect Max Verstappen to challenge him I didn't expect Max Verstappen to be second um, actually I thought uh, the second McLaren and Oscar Piastri would be second I thought the Mercedes would be up there um, so I think and I think Verstappen also felt the same and he uh, kind of reflected that in his comments after qualifying didn't he when he said that uh, he was pretty happy with second place I don't think he expected to be on the front row but the gap between them uh, the McLaren has got a lot of upgrades I wouldn't say it's like a totally new car but is that what you were expecting the upgrade to deliver because they kind of played down what performance those upgrades were going to deliver to the car I feel well it's only one race and the conditions have been very difficult uh, this weekend in Holland so um, we can't draw too many conclusions yet you're right this wasn't as big an upgrade as the one in Miami which turned them overnight into front runners um, and McLaren have been saying that but they've got a track record of their upgrades absolutely at least delivering what they expect them to do and sometimes over delivering like the Miami one did they've admitted since so I'm not surprised if it has moved them forward and on the face of it just looking at the naked numbers it does look like it's moved them forward they were already the sort of consistently fastest car if you like um, not always the fastest but the most consistently up there um, and they've just it seems just on the evidence of one qualifying session that they have taken another small step forward what Lando Norris really needs to do now is deliver on this qualifying pace and make it count on Sunday because that's where he's fallen short a few times this well, year. Well that is what I was talking to him about uh, after qualifying. Uh, let's hear from Norris then on pole position for the Dutch Grand Prix and he's been working on how to approach the second half of the season. I would say qualifying is probably the thing I've worked on the least. Um, <laughs> it's something I'm, I've always been well, good at and, and performed well in so probably probably not. Uh, it's probably more the race things and racing situations that I've, I've worked to try and improve so that's more something I'll find out tomorrow but it's, it's everything really, it's my approach to the weekends, it's my work ethic, it's um, yeah, all to try and achieve something like today and hopefully another good result tomorrow, so um, I'm happy with today, but the work still continues and we work hard, hard overnight to, to continue with this one. I reckon a lot of people are going to be watching you at the start, not just because you're on pole, but because that has been a tiny bit of a weak spot. Are you confident you can attack right from the off and these upgrades, are they going to help you in the race as much as they've helped you in quality today? Um, 
I think so. I, I, I normally when you just have a quicker car, it helps in every every condition. Um, but your idea right, is something I've needed to work on, not because it's been bad, but it's just not been as strong as it needs to be, simply. And um, yeah, I've worked on that, so we'll see tomorrow. Good luck. Thank you. So that was Lando Norris, fastest of anyone today, which of course means he is on pole position. But it is the start, isn't it? I mean, all eyes, as I said to him, are going to be on him because he's starting from the front, but also because there's been a lot of criticism about how he has started his Grand Prix. And that has sometimes meant race wins have got away from him. Yeah, I mean, it, it was the first question dear old Jalian Palmer asked him in the post-qualifying interviews, I think. So uh, look, I mean, just take the last race, last time out of Belgium. He lost about three positions coming out of the source, all because he went a little bit deep, dipped a wheel on the gravel that had been brought in there, a little bit closer to the exit curb. And, you know, even before he got on the throttle at the exit, he'd lost three positions. And, and you can't be doing that when you're in the hunt now regularly. We have said so often over the last few years when we've seen Max Verstappen's performances, we often say, that he never makes a mistake. There's, there's never an issue for him, whether it's a car problem or on his driving side, because he's a championship level driver. He has grown so much over the years and he's able to really deliver when he's got the car beneath him and he doesn't make those mistakes. They're little mistakes for Landon Norris, but they all add up. And I think it's almost caught the team perhaps a little bit by surprise that they're, they're this good this quickly. You know, I think if you listen to the, the Zach Brown interview that uh, that Andrew did in the, the Check and Flag podcast, uh, that they were expecting to improve, but perhaps more so to be at this level for next year, 2025. But okay, you, that hasn't happened. You're good now, so you need to be on it. Not only from the driver's side, Lando Norris leading that team. He's an, he's young, but he's the experienced head in that team. He needs to cut out these little mistakes. It's about 160 meter run down to turn one tomorrow uh, from pole position. He's got Verstappen alongside. Here, the other thing is Verstappen will get his elbows out no matter what. Norris has now experienced that from Austria, fighting with Verstappen. So tomorrow will be a really interesting example to see how much Norris has learned from the first half of the season, from cutting out the turn one, the, the, the lap one mistakes, but also how to deal with Verstappen as well. Because I think tomorrow he needs to go out and win that race and win it well. Otherwise, I think the pressure ramps up immensely on, on how much we look at Norris as a, as a, a championship-level driver. And it can get into a driver's head, can't it? Once you start thinking about the start, you can't stop thinking about the start, and it becomes too much to get past, and that's, it can make or break a race. Well, he says he's been working on it over the summer break as much as you can work on it over the summer break. Uh, they've had, they had a week leading up to the summer break after Spa, and then a few days this week leading up to Zandvoort this weekend. Um, you know, it's actually... a when you start to think about it, it's quite a surprising statistic that he hasn't won another race since his maiden victory in Miami back in early May because of how strong McLaren had been in that time. You know, and there've been a few, as, as Harry says, it's, it's small mistakes, but you know, they've all added up. Spa, he actually was a really silly one. He, he didn't need to, he wasn't even on the limit. He was just leaving space on, the inside, on, on, on his inside so as not to get hit around the first corner. And he just basically drove off the track into the gravel trap. That was probably the worst mistake, I think, uh, for me. Um, that cost him any chance of winning. Probably wouldn't have won anyway because he wasn't quite starting high enough up and there was no overtaking at Spa, really. Hungary, again, pole position, allowed himself to get caught on the run to the first corner and that gave Piastri the win. Silverstone, it was on the team with the strategy. Uh, they put the wrong tyres on his car at the final pit stop. It didn't help that he went a bit long at that stop, but, uh, you know, stopping a bit beyond his marks. Uh, Spain, again, he made a good start, but Verstappen made a better start. That got Verstappen ahead, which meant Verstappen could pass George Russell, who'd got past both of them at the start. Another win lost. Canada, this team weren't on it again. They didn't, they, they had about a second and a half to call Norris in when there was a safety car. They didn't react, they should have done. So these are all forgivable mistakes up to a point. They've been at it now for eight races or something like that. They need to start delivering. So does Norris. You can kind of sense it. He's getting a lot of questions on this topic. He's very open and honest about the errors he's making. But 
I think he'd rather not be getting the questions. And the only way he can not get the questions is if he, if he starts not doing those things on the track. Do you think he's too open and honest? You know, coming out with, with uh, uh, and I paraphrase, call, you know, calling stuff. He hasn't been driving at the level uh, of, of a championship winning driver. Uh, Andrea Stella refuted that, the team principal. But you, yes, you've laid it out black and white. He has made these mistakes. But when you're openly sort of publicizing them as well, that all ramps up again in, in the mentality of a driver. I think it's his way of dealing with it. Mm. It's him saying, I'm doing this, I'm going to sort it out. And do you know what? Looking at it from the outside, I'd much rather have it that way than the way Michael Schumacher used to do it, for example, who just never, ever admitted he made any errors, ever. And it just <laughs> used to drive me absolutely mad. We'd argue black was white and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, it's just ridiculous. Lando's been like that all the way through his career, though, because I remember interviewing him in F2 after races, and he was so critical, straight out of the car, always criticising everything. And he was finishing in, in the top part of the grid, obviously, because he was in the part Fermi interviews, but always been so critical. And I guess that is just his character. You can't, you don't want to, block that out because then you're not yourself are you a lot of the new generation of drivers are like that Charles mm. Leclerc is exactly the same um, berate and, themselves yeah and George Russell up to a point as well and I think it speaks of an inner confidence uh, ironically you know it, it mm. speaks to him believing that he shouldn't be doing it and Andrea Stella was very kind about Lando Norris in the press conference yesterday the McLaren team boss but it is true what Norris said he hasn't been driving at the level of a world champion because world champions don't make that number of mistakes Small mistakes, but mistakes. You know, did you know? We, we people like Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, Fernando Alonso. They're famous. They have their status because they drive at such a high level all the time. And the, you see a mistake from them, it's like, whoa, what happened there? Norris needs to get to that level. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow will be a big moment for him, lining up alongside Max Verstappen, who. It's not just him, is it, really? It's a lot of thousands of uh, Dutch fans cheering him on as well. A little extra gear for the Dutch driver this weekend. And you say, Harry, you know, he gets his elbows out. It's his way or the highway sometimes going into turn one. And you'd like to think he's probably going to have that approach tomorrow afternoon. Paul is on the left-hand side here. So Verstappen will have the inside line going into Tarzan turn one. And... Depending again on the start, comes down to Norris. Uh, Verstappen is usually pretty hot on his starts. That's going to get tasty. Look, Verstappen has won every single race here since he came back onto the calendar. He's been on pole position every single time as well. He's currently experiencing his longest run of winless races. And listening to him across the weekend, he's not happy. He, Red Bull need to do more. And the upgrades they've brought this weekend haven't exactly delivered a turnaround for the car. And it's amazing how quickly things change from the first seven races to the last seven races. All of the off-track noise that Verstappen has, has actually handled incredibly well doesn't seem to have affected his uh, on-track ability whatsoever. And that is the high, that highlights, I think, his clear mentality and determination that he all he cares about is winning. All he cares about is getting the best result. And that's what differentiates himself at the moment, at least from a from a public perception to, to Norris where he's so open and honest about his mistakes and trying to improve whereas Verstappen just has this expectation that he should be at the front and always be at the front and I think that's what drives this sometimes volatile uh, defensive manoeuvres that we see on track Austria the, the most obvious example I can think of in, in recent times and that's why I think it will be so crucial to see how much Norris has learned from that um, where there's supposed to be dry tomorrow although we've, we're throwing the radar out the window so I don't think uh, the rain that's just been pummeling down is going to have too much of an effect but it's a short run down to turn one overtaking is tricky round here if Verstappen gets in front Norris is going to have a tough job to get past him yeah I think it's going to be paramount whoever comes out of turn one whoever gets that whole shot as they say uh, could well be the race winner but Max Verstappen Normally, and he was saying this after the qualifying, you know, normally in the years gone by, he knew that if he qualified third or fourth, he'd kind of got the machine to get the job done. But it doesn't seem like he's got that at the moment. He was saying how he hopes the car will be OK tomorrow. Let's have a listen to what he said after qualifying, starting from P2. Of course, I'm not happy, but uh, we're, we're doing everything we can, you know, to make it competitive and as fast as we can. But it's, it's still, of course, uh, too slow compared to in McLaren. But uh, yeah. We, uh, we tried to optimize the balance, um, qualifying was a bit difficult, uh, possibly also because of the wind, it was very windy and it just seemed like my car was very sensitive to it. P2 means you're still right up there, so when it comes to race pace, how confident are you that you can challenge Lando and Oscar? 
Mm. I think at the moment that is not really something that is also a particular strong point for us uh, lately. I think the McLaren is very good in every aspect, you know, so it's not like the last two years where even if I would qualify P2 or P3, whatever, I would, I would be quite confident that in the race we would be quick. That, that it has disappeared, so um, I guess we just have to wait and see tomorrow. Um, of course, I'll try to you know be as close as I can, try to profit from maybe some mistakes or whatever. You never know how a, how a race can turn out, but I think on pure pace it will be quite difficult. On Thursday, you said you feel the team needs to improve as a team. Do you feel that's happening over the last couple of days? I know it's a small... We are uh, learning. Okay. We are um, analysing a lot of things. Yeah. That was Max Verstappen after qualifying. P2 for him today. I think he was sort of satisfied with that, which seems strange, as you say, Harry goes out, obviously, to always take pole and the win. But I think he goes into the Grand Prix with a, a realistic expectation that given the gap in qualifying, the gap in the race, or at least the challenge of the race, is going to be quite a, a difficult one to overcome. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the best opportunity for him is going to be in that run down to turn one and on lap one. I think Verstappen has that obviously sprinkle of driver ability that he can drive beyond the means of, of any car that he's in. Uh, but three and a half tenths around this track is the second shortest circuit on the calendar. It's a track, I mean, they all know quite well Verstappen in particular in terms of outright pace. You know, the McLaren, McLaren and Norris have it over them. Simple as. Red, Red Bull have, have taken a... I don't know if they've taken a step back or if the others have just made a leap forward. Look, if, um, if the McLaren is as quick as it looked on Friday, and if Norris can translate his qualifying pace into the race, which is effectively saying the same thing, it doesn't. It probably won't matter that much if he's behind Verstappen after the first lap, because they should be able to beat them with strategy combined with pace, in theory. Um, that's not always the easiest thing to do, but they've got the potential to do that because they look so fast. Um, but yeah, well, let's wait and see. And I think their race preparation on Friday, Andrea Stella, the team principal, was saying how happy they were with that, running both the soft and the medium tyres to compare them. So I think they're feeling pretty confident. They've got the job done today, and I think they're probably pretty confident they can turn that into a win come tomorrow, uh, which obviously is not great news for Max Verstappen. Um, Oscar Piastri, P3, I think there was more on the table for him, and I know he sort of had a messy lap, didn't he? First half went well on that final flying one, and then um, it slightly got away from him. Does he need to be closer to Lando? I mean, it, he's still up in P3. It's not a sort of Max Verstappen versus Sergio Perez issue teammate-wise, is it? They had the potential to block out the front row again, and I think that's a regret for them probably, uh, because the, you know the more the more cars you have in front of Max Verstappen when you're trying to win a race, the better. Um, but and half a second is not the sort of margin Piastri would expect to be behind Norris. But uh, yeah, he obviously underperformed on that lap. But he's only one place behind Verstappen, so he can be in the mix at the start and for the rest of the race as well. And that car is quick. So let's hear from Piastri, the Australian driver, P3 in qualifying. It is, of course, a good spot to be starting on the grid, but when the car's capable of being on pole, it's, uh, yeah, you always feel like there's a bit more on the table. So a bit frustrating to, to not have gotten more out of the car, but um, still a, a good place to be starting and a good opportunity to score a good result tomorrow. Do you feel ready for the race and these upgrades? Are they making a big difference, do you feel? Uh, I mean, they're doing what we expected them to, which is is always positive. It's you know been a, a real strength of ours for the last uh, 12, 18 months. So it's you know big credit to the to the team for making that happen and always putting on uh, parts that that make us better. Um, but it feels very similar. Uh, it just makes us quicker, which is is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I would take it. Yes. <laughs> good luck tomorrow. Thank you. So that's your top three: Norris, Verstappen, and Piastri. Behind them, it was George Russell and his teammate Lewis Hamilton, unable to even get into Q3. The difference there, jaw droppingly uh, big and wide open. What went on? What happened there for Lewis Hamilton, Andrew? Well, he was he was on target to get through into Q3, uh, the top 10 shootout, but he made a mistake at the penultimate corner, had a, an oversteer snap, and uh, that cost him just over a tenth or so going down the straight to the finish line, and that was enough to make him not get through. But as he said himself, he wasn't quick anyway. They'd not had the greatest day, Mercedes. Um, I don't think either of them were particularly happy with the car. But Russell's optimistic he can uh, do better in the race, and let's not forget, 
you know, he won on the road, the Belgian Grand Prix, uh, before the summer break from uh, seventh on the grid, was it? And uh, Hamilton uh, wasn't expected to feature in that race, and he did win it. Um, so I think they will be stronger in the race. Um, so uh, I wouldn't count Mercedes out, and Russell's optimistic that he can mix it with Verstappen and the McLarens at the start. It's just interesting, because at the end of the second practice session yesterday, when the drivers talked to the media, both drivers quite buoyed up about how their Friday had gone, and then the team have made some, uh, as Lewis said, drastic changes overnight, which we were chatting a little bit earlier, Andrew. If everything's kind of going well, why are you making big changes? It's a little bit of a, a conundrum. Yeah, well, I mean, the conditions have changed a lot over the weekend, don't forget. You know, you, you're kind of guessing going into the weekend because you've done Friday, it was wet, then it was dry. and it, But it was super windy all the time. Today was supposed to be dry, but the morning was wet and it was much less windy, but it's been really warm. So it's like 25 degrees this afternoon, and they wouldn't know it from looking at the TV screens, but it's been actually quite warm and humid. Tomorrow, it's only 20 degrees and sunny. It's a roller coaster, so, this so whole thing. So how do you know what to do? You've got to, you've got to work all these sorts of things into your setup decisions, because those sorts of temperature changes, wind condition changes, they have a huge effect on the, on the way the car performs. And ju just because the Mercedes has been oversteery today doesn't necessarily mean it'll be oversteery tomorrow. Um, Hamilton's got too much to do from 12th on the grid, mm. but... Russell is definitely not out of it. So fourth for Russell, 12th for Hamilton. And behind George Russell is Sergio Perez. Hmm, P5. Okay, Max Verstappen's not on pole, so it's not as bad as it could have been for the Mexican driver. But as you have spoken about, Andrew, and as you've spoken about Harry during the practice sessions, this is a critical time for Sergio Perez because, yes, Red Bull have said we're sticking with him, really being pushed, I think, this weekend by some of the broadcasters, uh, Christian Horner, as to why they've stuck with him. But... It's not over, is it? There are a couple of races maybe where he's going to have a bit more of a grace period, but he needed to be a little bit further up even from P5. I actually think that was all right from Perez because it, it's the gap we kind of expect him to have with Verstappen. Yes, it's not where it should be, but off the back of what has been a really torrid time for him to, to get into the top five of the grid, off the back of what well, he was on, he got inherited on the front row in Belgium. The last time he actually had a half decent qualifying, you've got to go all the way back to Miami in fourth and then before that he was kind of getting front row and then a fifth or a sixth in quality so I think this is actually a better sign from Perez so yeah three tenths behind Verstappen that's respectable and he's lucky because there's you know he's, he's fifth Hamilton's not in the picture and the Ferraris are out of the way they're not you know they're not in the way he's not going to have to deal with the Ferraris in the way that he did in Belgium for example four weeks ago um, so he's got a chance now to have a good race the problem was he had a good chance to have a good race in Belgium and he didn't he dropped from uh, the front to the back of the lead group and um, but it just goes to show how much effort Red Bull are putting in to trying to get him back to what they believe he can do um, because he had some driver coaching uh, at Silverstone this week um, and uh, I found about that, out about that yesterday and um, mentioned it on air, Rosanna, and you asked him about it. I did, and I asked him if that driver coaching had helped him with his qualifying session today. Here's what he said. Um, no, it was just uh, get up, to, get up to, to speed, you know, it's always good to refresh your mind and um, things were, that I was struggling with, uh, understanding them, but uh, I think Generally speaking, it's been a very good weekend for the team in terms of understanding with the car, and I think we can go from there. And so tomorrow, you think you might be challenging for podium places, do you think? Uh, I think so. I think we, we got the, the pace and we got every hope to, to be strong for tomorrow. Yes, I didn't, I'm not sure he really wanted that question, did he? Because he sort of paused a bit, and <laughs> I think he was probably thinking, how do you know about that? It's because <laughs> I'm, I'm mates with Andrew Benson. Uh, but he, um, the last line was interesting. Things I was struggling with, understanding them. That's basically saying I needed this help. The guy who, he, who Red Bull used is someone called Rob Wilson. Um, he's a very well-renowned driver coach, and it's not that unusual for a Formula 1 driver to go to Rob Wilson, especially when they're struggling. Kimi Raikkonen's one driver, for example, who's done work uh, with him. And it's all about teaching the drivers, you know, sometimes they sort of get themselves a bit overwrought. It's about taking them back to basics, the feel, the steering, and all that sort of stuff. It sounds ridiculous that you can do this in a road car, which is where they do it. Rob Wilson sits next to the, the Formula One driver, and they talk, they talk them through their inputs on the steering wheel, the throttle, the brake, and uh, often it helps. And uh, maybe it's helped going into this race weekend. Uh, let's see if it helps going forward. I mean, it also sounds ridiculous, not just that it's done in a road car, but it sounds ridiculous. He's one of the 20 best drivers in the world, and he's asking for, like, driving lessons, huh? <laughs> 
I know, but it, as I say, sometimes it works. Some drivers don't ever need it. Hamilton, Alonso, Verstappen, you're not going to get them going to Rob Wilson. But um, <laughs> Who knows? If Perez <laughs> wins this weekend, maybe they'll all be queuing up and you won't yeah. be going to Silverstone for love nor money. Uh, I think it'd be a surprise if he won, Rosanna, don't you? But, <laughs> <laughs> well, from fifth on the grid, I think he's going to need a lot to happen uh, up ahead of him. So P5 for Sergio Perez. Behind him, Charles Leclerc. Ferrari in a little bit of a tricky spot at the moment. Then it was Fernando Alonso. Alex Albon, nice little moment for him. Yes, however, oh this dear. just in, after the qualifying session, the aerodynamic component and bodywork areas were checked on Albon's car and the floor body was found to lie outside the regulatory volume mentioned in, mentioned in Article 3.5.1A. Mm. Uh, Joe Bauer was referring that matter to the stewards for their consideration. Oh, Oops. I was reading that article this morning. Damn. Well, uh, so, great quality. But it might come undone. Ah, well, I'm glad you stopped me in my tracks then. So P8 on the road for Alex Albon. We will wait and find out. Then it was Lance Stroll, P9. He was overdriving a bit, he said. Uh, so maybe there was a little bit more in the tank. Pierre Gasly, P10. I think they were pretty chuffed with that, Alpine, because uh, it's been a tricky season for them thus far. Carlos Sainz, a shocker, not managing to make it into Q3. He'd had gearbox issues on Friday, hadn't he? Not a lot of track time. He had basically three laps in the dry yeah. all weekend and then went into qualifying, I think. I know. think he said, you know, almost four weeks without driving because of the yeah. summer break and then you're suddenly in quali spec. It is not exactly the ideal run in. Lewis Hamilton, as we spoke about, P12. Oh, hang on, we've got a finger in the well, air also again. Well, just remembering that impeding uh, between Hamilton and Perez has gone to the stewards. We don't know the out the outlook on that yet. And that was Lewis Hamilton potentially in the way of Sergio Perez, so we'll have to watch out for that. So I think that brings us to the end of the podcast. Plenty to look out for in the I've Grand Prix. I've got about eight more minutes of stuff to say, if that's all right. <laughs> no. You've got more FIA notices. <laughs> Let's get them into the pod. It's a thrill a minute with you, Harry Benjamin. Um, it's going to be exciting. Do we reckon Lando Norris will be on the top step of the podium come tomorrow afternoon? He's hot favourite going into the race with a car that quick, a lap that good in qualifying. Uh, he needs to deliver it on Harry. tomorrow. I concur. Mm, well, RT. be careful. A lot of Dutch fans about. <laughs> Am I going to go uh, <laughs> diplomatic? Uh, look, I think Lando Norris and this McLaren seems to be pretty whizzy. That's a technical term. Uh, so I reckon it could well be him on the top step of the podium. But P2 and P3, hmm, that's a bit more interesting, I would say. Guys, thank you so much. Harry Benjamin, Andrew Benson, you will be talking us through the Grand Prix tomorrow afternoon as well. Oh, I hope it's going to be a thriller. I hope it's not going to rain in a way, just because I quite want to see the pace of these cars really put to the test. I think it's going to be dry. So I think it's going to be flat out all the way through the Dutch Grand Prix. Verstappen's going to be angling for another win on home soil. Norris is going to need that win. He needs the win. Piastri's going to want to play a cat amongst the pigeon role. Oh, can't wait. Right, well, we will be live on the BBC Sport website from quarter to two. Do join us then. Uh, I have been Rosanna Tennant, and this has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live.